Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and thanks for watching. Well, the legislature has less than two weeks to meet its June 30 deadline. What's going on with the state legislature? And then a cyber school update, all following these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Hi, welcome back to the program, and again, thanks for watching. Well, the Pennsylvania legislature is getting down to the fine-tuning, if I can say that. Uh, 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 dealing with the Pennsylvania budget, June 30 is a constitutional de deadline. We've brought in one of our experts, a guy who's been following legislature for many years, Jim Redmond. He's a senior vice president with a Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania. James, welcome. Thank you, Terry. All right, look, you've been going through this kabuki dance with the legislature for a number of years. Let me get this straight. House passed a, a, a budget, about $27 billion. Last week, the Senate approved the budget. They took a couple hundred million out, setting the stage for these final negotiations that will probably end up in something called a conference committee. We don't need to deal with that. Talk a little bit about what you think is likely to happen and what are the sticking issues to resolve this year's state budget. Sure. Um, well, clearly the vote by the Senate was a very strong indication that the legislature is not interested in any tax increases. Right. And uh, the, le the, the Senate reduced the uh, governor's proposal, which was essentially passed by the House, uh, by some $340 million, uh, keeping uh, spending uh, in the neighborhood of around a 2.7% increase over the current year. Um, expect, as you pointed out, the House to reject that, setting mm -hmm. up a joint conference committee to work out the final details. Uh, the governor indicates that he still wants uh, the legisl legislature to address the transit uh, roads uh, issue, tr mass transit issue, uh, his energy independence uh, uh, program, and also to address some of the components of his health care reform plan. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of three big sticking issues, and every one of those issues, and one that's gotten a lot of press recently, there, well, actually, all three of them have, but the energy bill, there are a couple of, there's a proposal that passed the House uh, on the mass transit and roads, there's an, a proposal. Uh, working its way through the legislature, each one of those sort of has taxes connected to them, including the health care proposal, which we can talk about in the next segment. Is there re a real reluctance in this legislature, given the newness of, you know, how many new members there are to vote taxes? Oh, clearly. And there's also a very strong feeling among the legislature that they've got to get the job done by June 30th. Yeah. And oh. uh, I expect that... Uh, most of it uh, hopefully will be done uh, uh, by June 29th, which is a Friday, and uh, maybe they've got to come back uh, uh, that Monday and Tuesday, the first week in July, just to kind of wrap things up. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they go beyond uh, the 4th of July, I think uh, the uh, public is going to be really upset with the legislature and the governor. I, I agree with that, and it, it is a kind of unusual situation because I want to get in later to some of these sort of structural or, or hidden costs, you know, particularly in Medicaid and on the health care side, something that you're really an expert on. Uh, but the state, on the surface, looks like it has a $500 million surplus. Everybody has been, you know, talking about that. There's no, in a sense, quote, imminent fiscal crisis. Normally, that's a situation in which the budget gets done on time with little debate. Or am I wrong about that? That's correct. Um but the governor outlined a very ambitious yeah. plan back in February, and uh, many of those are very, very tough issues, uh, even if there's agreement to kind of move in that direction. So it's going to, I think, take a while, and I'm not sure that uh, all of those issues are going to be addressed uh, uh, by the end of this month, but uh, it's going to spill over clearly into yeah. the fall. Well, let's go. We have a, you know, about 45 seconds left in this segment. Let's, let's go on and, and, uh, and, and talk about one aspect of that, and, and that is the, you mentioned it earlier, the, whether it's partisanship driving the differences or sort of constituency differences. The Senate passed a budget, Senate over 49 to 1, do I got that That's right? That's correct. With Democrats and Republicans pretty much in agreement, is this a House versus a Senate problem, or 
Uh, what, what's sort of the root of the problem? Is it just Rendell's a, a ambitious agenda with taxes connected to it? My sense is that three out of the four caucuses seem to be in, in agreement. The okay. Senate Democrats, the Senate Republicans, and the House, House Republicans. Republicans. It really has been the House Democrats yeah. that have been holding out, especially on the issue of uh, mass transit funding, which right. uh, is, is one of particular concern uh, to those legislators in the southeast uh, as well as in the Pittsburgh, Allegheny County area. All right, when we come back, we're going to turn to the subject of uh, health care, the uh, very important uh, proposal that the governor has made. How's he doing with that? And also what the funding looks like for several health care programs. We'll do that after these messages. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Pennsylvania Medical Society, doctors and patients, preserve the relationship. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, business in Pennsylvania is our business. Hi, welcome back to the program. I'm talking with Jim Redman. He's a senior vice president with the Hospital and Health System Association, expert on the budget process. We're now going to uh, talk a little bit about the health care budget. Uh, health care and social service, about 20 percent of this, uh, actually probably more than 27 billion because we've got another 25 billion or so coming in from the federal government that, pro you know, works its way through the state budget down to various recipients, I guess, uh, 56, 57 billion dollars. But at any rate, let's talk about what are, what are the big points of contention this year in the state budget where health care is concerned? Well, the biggest concern for hospitals was that the governor's proposal back in February reduced hospital payments by almost $144 million when you mm -hmm. include the federal match that, as you pointed out. Um, fortunately, um, with the Senate action, most of those uh, dollars were restored and we were also delighted that uh, some additional monies were put in for um, obstetrical services. We have a real crisis growing in this state. Yeah, the talk closing. about that a little bit. I mean, uh, uh, let's stop for a second. I want to stop sure. you there because I, that's something that I don't think a lot of our viewers are aware of. And, and make your points about that. Well, we've had uh, close to 35 hospitals close their maternity units over the past decade here in Pennsylvania. A lot of it has to do with... Um, uh, the growing cost of providing those services and uh, uh, the lack of adequate reimbursement from right. payers for those services. Right. And uh, the, the concern that we have is obviously maintaining services in inner city areas and in, in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been working to try to get some additional monies into the mm -hmm. Medicaid program and fortunately mm -hmm. the Senate agreed to go along with that. That We want to see a little bit more money go into yeah. that. We're going to be pushing the governor and the, yeah, the we, house to add to the, what the senate had done yeah we don't have i mean i want to go on and talk about uh, the governor just in general where this health care reform is in the state maybe that's something we'll have you back or someone else and you know from happen we can talk about that it's something that i wasn't aware of until i just read some information recently about how you know how how critical this whole obstetric service providing happens to be at the moment but let's turn, Jim, to the sort of the general topic of health care reform. The governor has this hugely ambitious program by any calculation, drops it into the legislative hopper in the February budget message. Uh, the polls that have been done, in fact, I did one in the Keystone poll, shows that citizens do want to cover the 900,000, you know, estimated 900,000 Pennsylvanians without any health care. But there is some controversy about how we pay for them. I'll talk a little bit about that and what you see happening with the health care reform proposals. Well, there were two components to the governor's plan. One was to reduce the number of, uh, of folks without health insurance, but also um, try to get at some of the cost drivers in the health care program. Right. And what I'm finding is that there's strong support in the legislature to do the second first. Let's right. drive down the and cost. try to control the costs. Once we've done that, then we can begin to add additional people to the health mm -hmm. insurance ranks. Um, what we're seeing so what, in the and the governor wants to do them together. Well, he's always said That's that he wants, wants to do to it know. together. I right. think the reality is uh, that uh, the legislature can only digest a certain amount at a, a period of time, mm -hmm. and yeah. we're seeing 
really two things kind of emerge out of legislature. One is uh, legislation to help reduce the incidence of healthcare associated infections, which right. has been a big topic, as well as uh, expanding the scope of practice for advanced nurse practitioners. Right. And, and you, are they the two most prevalent ideas for driving down the cost? Not necessarily. Um, but they're the two that got the, the action going that on. Kind of risen to the top in terms of the legislative agenda. And I expect uh, they probably won't be completed uh, by the end of this month to get all the way to the governor's desk, but yeah. uh, they'll be very close. Yeah. Now, just finally, he's insisted, of course, that he wants all of these things, although on some of them he has said maybe they can wait till September. If you had a, I'm going to put you on a spot. Are they going to get this done by June 30? <laughs> you, or at least maybe up to July 4th, but your point is if they don't get it done, they're in a world of trouble with the voters, I think. Yeah, I think that, you know, getting the state budget done is clearly the top priority. Yeah. Um, addressing the other things all can wait until the fall until and uh, I think they'll try to get as much done as possible but uh, much of the health care agenda I think is yeah. going to spill over until the fall. All right, great update. All right, when we come back, cyber schools, a recent study shown that uh, Pennsylvanians don't know very much about them. How about if we change that on Pennsylvania newsmakers? We'll do that after these messages. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Credit Union Association, Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money, and by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the State System of Higher Education, 14 state-owned universities, the state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania. And by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to Newsmakers. Well, often, as often is the case, we, we deal with an important subject of education. We've chatted about cyber schools over the years on Pennsylvania Newsmakers. Joining me now to talk more about cyber schools, their growth and their development is Jane Price. She's the Senior Vice President of the National Network of Digital Schools. Uh, one of her uh, uh, clients in the state of Pennsylvania is the Pennsylvania Charter, uh, Cyber Charter School. She has a variety of clients around the country that they provide services for. I wanted to get that perspective in. Uh, you know, it's pretty fascinating. Cyber schools have not been around all that long. Just give, in general, how long have they been around? Mm -hmm. In Pennsylvania, yeah. they've been around for about eight years now. The Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School will be starting its eighth year eighth actually year. this fall. But mm -hmm. in general, around the country, not this was one of the earliest ones, right? I mean, is this about a decade old movement in general? Would you say that would be true, Terry? And Pennsylvania is actually leading leading the nation yeah. in the development and the. Um, enhancement yeah. of what's available in online charter schools. And boy, in education terms, that's not a very long time. I mean, you know, we, we deal with programs on here that, you know, 30 and 40 and 50 years old. So, and that's obviously, I mean, I, I don't think our, a lot of our viewers, I mean, we, the term cyber school is mm -hmm. thrown around often very loosely. Give us sort of a shorthand definition of what a cyber school is. We, you know, I want to get into detail about what they do and all that, but what is a good definition? There you go. I would say that uh, Cyber Charter School, first of all, it's free. It's a public offering in the state right. of Pennsylvania. A student has to reside within the Commonwealth to enroll. And once enrolled, a student would get a computer, a printer, high-speed Internet, if available in his area, courses right. uh, from a, a wide selection. And that would include textbooks, materials, great teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's not about just sitting in front of a computer screen but it's about connecting with right. great teachers and other students while taking these courses. Right. Yeah, we, we had the, we've had the head of the, of the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School, Nick Trombetta, on the program on a number of occasions, and he you know, made, made the point about the quality of the education. One of the questions that comes up is, is this something that a student would do full-time, or would it be to, and or, could you supplement, you know, like the regular education you're getting with a, with a cyber school class? I mean, is there sort of an infinite variety of possibilities for, for parents and students out there? Indeed there are, and I think that's going to increase. 
Right now, if you reside within the Commonwealth and you choose to enroll in a cyber charter school, you must be a full-time student mm -hmm. in that school. So it is an all or nothing okay, type so of situation. Okay, so you have to be in the charter school itself full-time. You couldn't go, let's say, in, you know, pick a, in the Harrisburg School District where we, we're, you know, we're taping this program. Uh, you, you couldn't be a student in Harrisburg in the city school and then take a course Part time on the cyber, you know, in the cyber school. That at the moment, that's not possible. Is that what you're telling me? It's not possible to actually enroll in both. In both. Okay. In both. But it is possible through organizations like the National Network of Digital Schools for public traditional brick and mortar schools right. to purchase cyber s services mm -hmm. for their students. Yeah. So I think we're moving exactly in that direction, yeah. Terry. Yeah, I know in colleges, and you know, as a professor. We, we do, you know, a fair number of courses, not, not as many as I think as we will in the future where, you know, you can take courses online. Sure. I don't know if colleges are kind of reluctant and what that, professors, you know, not everybody is into the kind of technology. It's a pretty, mm -hmm. it's a pretty big, uh, a pretty big transition. Uh, how much have they grown in general over, over the last, uh, well, in, in Pennsylvania's case, eight years? Right now, there are over 10,000 students who are enrolled in cyber charter schools. This is in, in our state, in, in the state our of state PA. of PA. Yes. How about nationally? Do you have any? Flow? I don't have that number for you, but I know that it's growing exponentially yeah. each year. Terry. Yeah. And how many clients do you serve nationally? You have a wide variety of we them. We do, and we're close to about 30. And this is only our second year of operation. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back. We're going to continue the discussion. We hope we're increasing your understanding of uh, something you ought to know about cyber schools. We'll be back following these messages. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Builders Association, Building today for a better tomorrow. And by the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School, bringing educational innovation and freedom to the children of Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to uh, Pennsylvania Newsmakers. I'm chatting with uh, Jane Price. We're talking about uh, cyber schools, their growth and development, their evolution, if you will, over time. Jane, one of the interesting questions that always comes up has to do with, you know, who. Is there a particular demographic? Is there a typic, Is there sort of a typical family, or is this something that families in all economic and social conditions might avail themselves of? Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, some students simply don't get their needs met in traditional brick-and-mortar schools. Most do, mm -hmm. Terry, but some don't. Right. And so we are a nice option for families whose children are sick whose children have to travel. We have a lot of uh, entertainers and, and great athletes that need the flexibility that right. a cyber education can offer. We have many gifted and accelerated students who feel that they're held back in a traditional classroom. Yeah. We can allow them to, to move and to study when they want. There's a great deal of flexibility available. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, this type of schooling is almost 365 right. and 24-7. It could be, depending, I guess, is that right? I mean, that's the point about the flexibility. Correct. You, you can adjust it to schedules depending on where you happen to be at any given time. You know, one of the concerns that's been expressed, uh, I think we hear from time to time, has to do with the whole process. Well, and by the way, we get it, the same thing for sort of homeschooled, homeschooled kids, uh, is that there's not a enough time or appropriate socialization. Mm -hmm. what, 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 how do you respond to that? I mean, what's your, what's and your answer? Good, to that? positive socialization <laughs> is important to every child. Yeah. And we like to think that cyber schools are creative in how they can offer that to their families. Uh, at PA Cyber, we have things like back to school fairs, 
Uh, mm -hmm. We have a family link that's kind of like the old parent-teacher association right. where families actually gather with staff and teachers several times a year. We have field trips, Terry, uh, across the state where we invite children to attend and their families sometimes join them. So we do value the importance of socialization. And you have to remember, too, that the child is not really in isolation in front of that computer screen when they're learning. Instead, they're connected on the other side of that, and sometimes mm -hmm. even in real time, is a teacher, mm -hmm. a highly qualified teacher, and often other classmates as well. So we value socialization as much as, as any educator would. Yeah, and what about the extracurricular question? That, I mean, these are sort of the questions that, comes up, that come up when, whenever there's sort of a discussion of uh, cyber schools and uh, whether they're meeting what I guess someone would call the totality of the needs of a student. What about the, the extracurricular issue? That's a good question, too. And actually, at PA Cyber this year, we had two state champion wrestlers that were enrolled. Yeah. So many times, the student can participate in extracurricular activities in their resident school district yeah. and still belong. Yeah, and I guess that state by state school, state by state, there are either policies that get developed by the departments of education or by the legislature, and in some other states, I guess it's a school district. It's a, is that a complex? It can, it, can, it, yeah. it, it, it can vary. It can vary. The good news is that parents are extremely involved, and so if they can't get some of the activities that they want through their school in any way, then they'll find, they'll seek out mm -hmm. the, those opportunities. And you know, we have students at PA Cyber that are very involved in scouting or mm -hmm. you know, uh, community softball or soccer programs, that sort right. of thing. So parents find activities. Okay, we, we have about the 45 seconds. Let me ask you one last question about the nature of the curriculum. Great. Something that I think is important. Is it limited? Is it broad? Is it a, a, a extensive? Uh, say, say a couple words about that. I would say to you it's extensive, it's rigorous, mm -hmm. it's standards-based, it's flexible, and it can be fun. Um, so we want children to feel safe, but also successful in their learning. And the curriculum is such that it's uh, very high tech, mm -hmm. but also there's a high touch component of the teacher as the student works through the coursework. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, coming on the program. Thanks for the update. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and uh, you all stay well.